Hi, everyone. My name is Lala Jackson. I'm on the Beyond Type 1 team. I'm joined today by my teammate, Tiara Smith. And also, we are joined by our favorite diabetes psychologist, Dr. Mark Heyman. We have been speaking to Dr. Heyman throughout the past year about all of the things that we're hearing from you that you're dealing with, but we've been asking it in the forms of the things that we are also dealing with because we are right here with you, dealing with COVID, dealing with diabetes and all of the things that come with it. So today we're really excited to be talking to Dr. Heyman about a very specific subject. It's going to be uh, sometimes a hard conversation, but I think a really important conversation. And I think it's gonna give all of us some tools that we can really use right now. We're gonna be talking about trauma, how to identify it, some of the tools and resources to help us through it. So without much further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Heyman, for joining us today. Can you start to give us a little bit of an overview of what trauma is? Sure. So the definition of trauma is real or perceived danger and threat of death or serious injury. So if you um, are in a car accident, if you, if you experience a sexual assault, if you have been diagnosed with diabetes, um, that, is, that is the definition of a trauma. Also, if you have a close friend or family member who has experienced that and you have a, a, a belief or an actuality that, they, that you're going to lose them and they're going to be seriously injured or, or die in a situation, that's considered a trauma. I think that oftentimes trauma is thrown around as a buzzword and, uh, and it, as a substitute for um, stressful situations. And not that, it, not that stressful situations are not um, challenging for all of us to deal with. But, you know, and, and also I think that there's a lot of similarities in ongoing stress like COVID and the in quarantine and being in this situation for a long time. But though th that is not the definition of trauma. The tra definition of trauma is having an, an event um, and, or sometimes a series of events where you are in danger of dying or you are, or you perceive that you are in danger of serious injury or death. And what are some of the ways that someone might be able to recognize that they did in fact go through something that their minds and body are processing as a trauma? Yeah, so when somebody experiences trauma, um, and I, I'll use the example of a car accident as, as, a, a, as an example here. Um, generally speaking, what happens is your anxiety level increases. Um, and that's a natural thing. We would hope that would happen because it, it's, it's, it's your body's way and your mind's way of keeping you safe. And what happens is you have a couple of symptoms. Um, oftentimes you have what, what we call re-experiencing. And so you have either intrusive thoughts or you have nightmares around um, that event. You also have what's called hypervigilance, which means that you are, a, for example, with a car accident, you may be um, nervous to see a car or when the, when, you know, nervous next the first time you drive after a car, after, a, after your car accident. Um, so you're going to be uh, vigilant and kind of be uh, being on guard. And then the third symptom that we see is what's called avoidance. And that's exactly what it sounds like. You avoid situations, um, people, things that remind you of that trauma. And, but when those happen, those aren't problematic in and of themselves. Uh, th those are actually a really natural response. What the, what the challenge with trauma is, is when those symptoms of re-experiencing um, avoidance and hypervigilance stay with you and they don't resolve because um, naturally they, um, th they, th they should resolve. But when you get stuck in those symptoms and, they, and, you, and you stay there in that hypervigilance, avoidance and re-experiencing state, that's where it becomes really problematic for us. Um, because the context is different in your life because you're, you're not in danger anymore, but your body and your mind is telling you that you are still in danger. And that can cause all kinds of challenges in our functioning and our ability to live in the world in a really effective way. That totally makes sense. I want to go through some of the things that I've heard on Dr. Internet to debunk some stuff and maybe verify some stuff. One of the phrases that I've heard is that you can't process trauma while you're in it. I don't know if that's true or not. Can you clarify that statement? Yeah, I, I think that that's um, I think that's probably a, a fairly accurate way of of putting it. Because when you're in a traumatic event, or you're experiencing a traumatic event, um, or you're experiencing ongoing stress, um, your your goal is to keep yourself safe. And so um, if, you're, if you are on guard because there is a danger coming at you, either perceived or real, and you want to stay alive, and your mind is telling you to stay alive, 
your mind doesn't have the capacity to, to process that. Your, your goal is to stay alive. It's kind of like having a low blood sugar. Like when you're low, like all you want to do is eat and get your blood sugar up because your, your, your body knows that if you don't do that, you can get yourself in some really big danger and really big trouble there. And so not that trauma and low blood sugar are in any, any way equated, but it's kind of this, it's, it's the same concept. Your body is telling you like, I need food. Your body is telling you, your mind is telling you, I need to get out of this situation. And you cannot process something while, while you are in it because those symptoms that we just talked about are actually really helpful for you. They're keeping you safe um, in, that, in that place. Um, the, when you're outside of that situation, and those symptoms continue in the long term, that's where things get challenging. That's where the processing really needs to happen. I hear you completely. With Before we get into kind of the tools and resources that we can use with Tiara, mm -hmm. I wanted to first jump into an assessment. If I think I may have been through something or I don't think I've been through something, what are some tools I can use to just kind of assess where I'm at? I'm thinking specifically like if I have recently gone through a diagnosis of diabetes, you know, mm -hmm. for me, it was 20 something years ago, but for someone who might be going through something really recent or maybe not so recent that they haven't processed yet, I think in this day and age, we're often taught to like, just kind of push through it. And if you just keep going, the, the bad stuff will go away, mm -hmm. but how can I really look at myself or how can someone really look at themselves and figure out if this is something that they might need some help processing? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the, the simple answer is look, looking at your behavior and how you are right now and how that's impacting your ability to live in the world. You know, is it impacting your work? Is it impacting your relationships? Is it impacting your sleep? Um, and if you're having trouble in your relationships because of a diagnosis with diabetes or because of some other trauma, if that's really making you stay away from relationships or be over-dependent on relationships, if you're having trouble sleeping and you're you're having nightmares on a regular basis and that's impacting your ability to work because you're, you're so tired, if you're not able to focus on your work, um, those are some really good signs that you might need help because the trauma is not resolving on its own. Again, I, I look back to, uh, you know, using a, the example of a car accident. So imagine that you get in a car accident today, God forbid. And um, so you get your car towed, you get it fixed and it comes back to you. And so you get, you, you go and you get in your car and you drive it for the first time, maybe next week after it's all fixed up. Um, you're probably going to be a little bit nervous and that's normal. Like you're, you're, you just experienced something pretty traumatic and now you are trying to kind of, you know, move or process that and, and move through it and, and show yourself that driving is generally a safe thing. Although the one, the, the thing that happened to you that one time is a one-off, um, but you're going to be nervous. And, and so you do it, but the more, the more you're able to drive, and, and see that you're safe driving, then the easier it gets. But if you're, if the same situation happens and you go to get in the car and you just can't, you cannot get yourself to um, open the door um, or you can't um, get in the car without taking three Xanax um, and you, you're, you're, so you're avoiding that anxiety in that way, that shows you that you're not able to function um, at a high level, like you want to, and the trauma is the, the reason why. And that, that's a good sign that you may need some help. So moving into tools and resources, I'm going to pass it over to Tiara. Thanks, Lala. And thank you, Dr. Heyman, for just breaking all of that down when it comes to trauma. While you were talking, I was thinking, you know, this is probably the best example of collective trauma that we've been through in our lifetimes mm -hmm. with COVID. Yeah. Um, and I feel like we're still in that state of hypervigilance and mm -hmm. sensing danger. And I think as people with diabetes, we know that our risks of severe complications or, or even death from COVID are very mm -hmm. real. Yeah. Um, but we are starting to see that, that sort of light of the tunnel, people mm -hmm. are getting vaccinated, but I don't think that means that the trauma is going to just go away. So what are some ways that we can start to process uh, our traumatic experiences, especially as people with diabetes um, going forward? What are some tools that we can use? I think, you know, community is, is really number one, both 
um, using the resources of the community that we have, but also talking about it and, and just being open about how this experience has impacted all of us and it impacted us individually and impacted us as a society. I, th I think that's number one. I think the, the number two thing is really using the data to drive our behavior. You know, I, I've talked to a lot of my patients recently about this, many people who have been very, very isolated because of COVID, both because th there's, no, there's nothing to do, but also because they have fears about it. And talking about what's going to happen next once they get vaccinated or once the world opens up. And there's a lot of people who are really, you know, saying, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be going out until 2023. And my response, and that's, that, that's a really kind of scary and a, a really kind of a hopeless place to be. And my response to that is, up until now, and even right, and what even right now, you know, going out, or sorry, not going out, not going to restaurants, wearing a mask, all of those things, those are really important things. Those are really functional, and so, and, and that, that, and those things are keeping us safe. But there's going to be a, a time in the future, hopefully sooner rather than later, when those things are not going to be necessary anymore, and they're not going to be helpful anymore. And not and not socializing is not going to be helpful anymore. But if we if we continue in the belief that we are in danger there, then and that goes against what the evidence is showing us that taking the case rates are down, you're vaccinated, then you you get stuck in this traumatic cycle of not being able to process, not being able to move forward. And so what I would suggest. Um, that people do is, of course, follow the public health guidelines. Don't, 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 do not disregard them. But when the public health guidelines say it's okay to go to the grocery store and not wear a mask, or it's okay to go to a restaurant and eat inside, um, and you're, you know, and you may feel a little bit uncomfortable doing that, I would really encourage you to push yourself to do that because can, that that continued avoidance is going to keep you stuck, and so. We have to, uh, trauma and traumatic events are very contextual. And in, in, when you're experiencing the trauma or when you're in danger, those types of behaviors are keeping you alive. But when the context is different, those types of, uh, those types of behaviors are keeping you stuck. And it's important to recognize that context. And if you're having trouble recognizing that or having trouble taking those steps when it's safe and when it's objectively safe, that may be a time when we need, you need some professional help because um, trauma and PTSD, post-traumatic stress, which is exactly, it, it's that keep that, that stuck place after a trauma, um, those things generally don't resolve on their own. Um, the, the, those, those are things that really require um, some help in getting you um, to a place where you can be more flexible in the world. Mm. All of that. And I'll even say like, there's no shame in, getting extra help or professional help. I know for me, I started therapy in COVID just because of like how, how scary it is. And mm -hmm. there's also, we miss, we miss the human interaction, right? Not seeing our family, not seeing our friends. And as human beings, we need that, that interaction. And sometimes you can't always get that digitally. So you want to see the people who you love and we're learning that, okay, there are probably little pods of people who can probably get together Mm -hmm. uh, if you're wearing masks, um, we've learned that if you're outdoors and within in six feet, you know, you can safely see, see people you love. Um, mm -hmm. But still, like you say, you're in that traumatic cycle. So you're like, well, I don't want to get sick or worse. I don't want to get someone I love sick. So that I think that's also part of that, that cycle as well. But even then, like we know that this, this isolation that we've been in for a year can definitely take a toll, especially how we interact with one another. How mm -hmm. do we make sure that our personal traumas are not impacting others? I guess, in other words, how do we make sure that we're not lashing out and taking out our anger and fear on other people? Yeah, that's a tough question. And, I, and that, that's one that you know each one of us has to do some introspection in and really um, you know, make sure that, that that's not happening. I think that you know the the first piece of advice is to do that introspection and say, you know, I'm really, I, I'm angry right now, or I'm feeling stressed right now, and I'm lashing out at my friends and family. What's causing that? Is it them or is it me? Um, 
and maybe it's them, but but more most likely or more likely than not, it may be you, especially kind of given the stress that we've gone through. And so, if you're able to see that, and you're able to use that as as use use that introspection, the ability the ability to look at yourself from the outside and make change, then that's really helpful. Also, it can be it can be really helpful when you notice yourself getting those that anger and whether that's or, or that lashing out, that 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 um, impulse to, to lash out is take a deep breath. And just you know, give yourself a beat and see if you can, you know, make a choice not to. If you if you're having trouble making that choice, if you're having trouble like actually taking that, having that space and being able to um, choose whether or not you lash out or not, that may be a sign that you need some um, some professional help. But if you're able to do that on your own and you're able to just say, you know, you're able to calm yourself down and then it be intentional about how you respond. Um, that it can be really helpful. And that's a sign that you have the ability to do this on your own. But again, as, as you say, there's no shame in getting, getting help because staying in that side place can become, it, it becomes actually, it generally becomes um, even, you get even more stuck and more stuck the longer it happens. Yes. And I'll, I'll even give like a personal example of, of exactly what you were just talking about. Um, part of our trauma is seeing, seeing people um, probably travel when, people shouldn't be traveling or mm -hmm. doing things that we perceive that, you know, that they shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. uh, because we're afraid to do them. Mm -hmm. And the example I'll give is there was someone close to me who went on vacation, mm -hmm. they got on a plane, traveled because they were like, I do, I, I'm tired. I, I need a break. And instead of asking them, okay, well, what's going on? How, like, how can I help? I went straight to you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill someone else. Like just completely lashing out mm -hmm. and not recognizing that that was my, I was projecting my fear onto that person. And it wasn't until I talked to a professional, uh, my, my therapist about it. And he helped me look at it like, well, have you asked her how she feels about, about what's going on? Have you asked her if she's, if, do you know if she's assessed the risks and have you, has she done the research and all of that? And basically saying, it's not about you. It's about, it's about the person, you know, close to you. And I found that that really helped because it is taking myself out of it and putting someone else first and, and also accepting that that person is able to make their own choices and you have to trust that those people are going to, are doing everything they can to be safe, whether you agree with what they're doing or not. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt like that was an example of my COVID trauma, especially my COVID trauma as a person with diabetes being projected onto someone else. And, yeah. but, and, and, and I think that COVID, you know, again, back to the conversation we had a minute ago about what trauma is, I think that in some instances, this is trauma, but in some instances, it's, it's ongoing stress. And in some ways, that can be actually even more challenging to deal with because it's, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's day to day, every day, Groundhog Day you know, same thing over and over again. And that's stressful for all of us. And so we feel very boxed in and very, um, have a difficulty just being in the world because it's hard to right now. And so, and so that, that sort of stress builds up and then we, we take it out on other people. I've certainly been guilty of that as well. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, um, I think this is, I think what you said about introspection is, is right. I think especially as the world kind of starts to open up, more people are getting vaccinated. So more people are, they're itching just to get out there. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're feeling super strong feelings, I, I would I would probably say to, you know, journal it out, write it down um, and really analyze like why, where those deep feelings are coming from. Yeah, but I want to say, you know, when we're th talking about trauma and if you, if you are looking for professional help around trauma, I would really encourage you um, to make sure that you're that you find a therapist who knows what they're doing with trauma, um, and th there's a couple reasons I say this. Um, one is that trauma therapy is hard. It's hard for the ther it's hard for the person getting the therapy, but it's also hard for the therapist because the therapist's job here is really to push the person out of their comfort zone. Um, it, certainly with a, in, with a compassionate way, but if someone comes to me who's experienced trauma and they say, "I'm really." worry about leaving my house um, because I'm worried that um, I'm going to have a low blood sugar when I leave my house. Okay, um, fair enough. 
if I said, well, then, you know, I think what you should do is just stay home. I think we should, in, or, in order to keep you calm, in order to keep your, you not, not stressed, I want you to stay home. And that's probably a good thing for you. That's actually doing the exact opposite of what needs to happen. What needs to happen is for us to assess the risk. And then if the risk is at an acceptable level, objectively, is to push the person to become uncomfortable. And that's hard to do. And if you're not trained to do that well, um, it is, it's easy to get trapped in this way of like, oh, it's going to be okay, stay home. Um, and so finding a therapist who, who, who is trained in trauma therapy um, is important. Can you, um, can you give some like tips on how people can find or, or at least interview a therapist to make sure that that therapist is, is actually trained in that? Um, or if that, or that therapist would be for them, what are some common things that you should ask a potential therapist before getting Yeah, so, so, so there are a couple of evidence-based treatments for um, PTSD and for people who've experienced trauma. Um, the three that are, well, the, the, there, there are, yeah, I would say that there are three big ones. One is called prolonged exposure. And what that is, is it is a, a, a therapy where um, the person is asked to recount the trauma out loud. Um, and be, as a way of processing it, as a way of kind of making sense of it, um, as well as doing things in the world. So making a list of things that are scaring you and that you're, that are, that you're not doing and going out and doing them on a, on a graded level. Um, the other one's called cognitive processing therapy, which is a cognitive therapy, which really focuses on a couple of different areas, including safety, trust, intimacy, um, and seeing how the trauma has impacted those areas and really finding ways to reframe your thoughts and then, and then moving your behavior forward um, in those areas. And the other one is called EMDR, which is a therapy where um, it, it includes bilateral stimulation. So, you know, tapping, um, which is not, it, it's evidence-based because it, it, it helps the brain to process it as well as to have, ex, have those exposures. Um, so asking a therapist how, how they treat trauma and, if they, and, and what, evidence, what evidence is in place to support the treatments that they use. If they're not able to answer that question, they're not the right therapist for the person who's experienced trauma. The th the, because therapists who are gonna help you dealing with stress with your relationships are may not be the right therapist to, to help you if you've experienced a traumatic event, like a diabetes diagnosis, like a car accident, a sexual assault, or, um, you know, or having COVID, or having a family member who's had COVID. And that's just, that's just, just like you wouldn't go see um, your dermatologist for your diabetes, you don't want to go see a relationship therapist for a trauma-related issue. Thank you Thank for you. that, Dr. Heyman. I think, Tiara, do I have any more questions before? Oh, no, I, I was going to say uh, thank you for, for answering that. Those are really good tips. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tiara. I think my last question, Dr. Heyman, is I know so many people in our community have loved ones who have also been through some real traumatic events and mm -hmm. care a lot about those people. I would love to give some tips to those people as well. If you have a loved one who you can see has clearly gone through or is going through a trauma, but is maybe reticent to recognize that or reticent to get help. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm certainly not a trauma therapist. I don't know how to help. What's the best way that we can lend support to those um, loved ones who are going through something? I think the best way is really being transparent about how what, what your observations are about what's happened to that person is, has impacted them and also how that's impacting you. So for example, let's say that your mom is this person that you're, that you're seeing is having a lot of trouble because of a trauma because of COVID. And that's impacting her ability to come over to your house for dinner or to talk to you on the phone for that matter. Um, and so saying, you know, mom, I'm really concerned about you because it used to be we talked on the phone every, every three days. And now when I talk to you on the phone once a month, it seem, you seem like you're really having a really hard time. And I really want to regain that relationship. And, you know, I want to do whatever I can to, to do that as well. But, you know, I, I want to let you know that, that what's happening for you, it seems to be impacting you a lot, but it's also um, impacting me. And so what can I do to support you in helping us to get back what we had before? Um, and, and, and so I think that kind of that, that sort of transparency of, of letting the uh, kind of opening the window and letting somebody see a reflection of um, how what's happening is um, impacting them, which they may not be aware of, or they may, it may, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see that, but also how 
it's impacting you and your and and you. Um, that can kind of give them both sides and hopefully um, give them the courage and motivation they need to um, get help if they need that. Thank you so much, Dr. Heyman. Any closing thoughts on trauma and what we're all going through? <laughs> no, I think that you know I, the la the last thing I'll say is that you know it, that we've all experienced uh, stress over the past. Um, the past year and that it's been significant. And I think it's gonna be a, a little bit of a road getting out of this situation. Um, you know, when things get back to quote unquote normal, um, I think it's gonna be hard for all of us to do that because we're just so used to being in this place of not doing things. And it's gonna be really weird to have people in your house again or go to a restaurant again. And so be patient with yourself um, and, 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 you know, just give yourself some grace but also um, when it's safe and when the public health officials are letting us know that it's safe, um, you know, push yourself to be uncomfortable in those situations because we, we, the last thing we wanna do is continue to get stuck and kind of have this collective trauma um, impacting our lives um, in the future. I know it's going to, but the, the more we can push ourselves to um, get back into a routine that may not feel comfortable right away, just like things didn't feel comfortable when we started this whole process, we didn't know what was going on. Um, the same thing is gonna be the process for getting out of it because now we're kind of used, so used to it. And we're used to, even though it's not a not comfortable at all, we're used to the discomfort. And so we're gonna have to kind of get back into that. And it's gonna be a process. So patience and grace and, um, you know, in you know, a willingness to seek out support if you need it, whether it's um, friends and family, the diabetes community or a professional. Amazing. Thank you, as always, for your time, Dr. Heyman. It's always such a pleasure to learn from you and speak with you, and the community appreciates you so much. You're very welcome. Bye.